Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Storage Investor Show. My guest today is Greg Goslin. He is the Associate Vice President at Collier's out of Charlotte, North Carolina. He's on the industrial team, and we're here to talk about industrial outdoor storage. Greg, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me, man. It's awesome. Appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Let the folks know a little bit more about your background in about 60 seconds or less. Yeah. So on the industrial team here in Charlotte, you know, we cover the greater Charlotte market. I'm from Kernersville, an hour and a half uh, from Charlotte. Went to school in Raleigh, NC State. I've uh, been in Charlotte for about 12, 13 years. Um, I've been in brokerage probably for six and a half years. I call yours for three. Uh, 100% industrial. I've uh, been gravitating towards uh, what we're going to chat about today, industrial outdoor storage. Uh, it's uh, blown up on the map and uh, institutional investors are chasing it. Um, and, you know, I've been covering that for the last, you know, two and a half, three years. And, uh, really digging deep into the market and, and, and what's been going on, but, um, really enjoying it. Um, you know, real estate brokerage has been, uh, it's been a great, you know, great path for me. And, um, you know, I'm really enjoying the industrial side. of it. Awesome, man. We're going to talk about, you know, what's going on in the industrial space and kind of how people are making money. I, I just saw the other day, uh, uh, Zenith or some group out there raised 750 million it was north of half a billion dollars to go out and buy, you know, obviously JV structure to go out and buy industrial outdoor storage. But for those who don't know, describe what an industrial outdoor storage is uh, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that that uh, that partnership with JP Morgan, Zenith went out and raised a bunch of money to buy what we're calling industrial outdoor storage. Um, you know, it's it's essentially. Um, an area for uh, industrial users, whether an owner user or a tenant of a uh, facility to store materials, trucks, equipment, um, you know, what have you outside um, that is, uh, you know, usually associated with some sort of building on site uh, and also uh, is allowed by zoning. So that, that's one of the biggest things that we can chat about today is um, you know, the zoning of these assets that, that people are chasing, uh, it's a very specific zoning has to be heavier industrial zoning. Um, and you know, usually, uh, is allowed at, at a very limited case, uh, within counties, um, because of, uh, the dirty nature, uh, you know, of the sites, but, um, in a nutshell, it's essentially you're driving down the side of the road, you see a United rentals and Sunbelt rentals, uh, you know, those types of tenants that are storing you know, equipment that you can go and rent um, to work on construction sites or, you know, tenants like Ferguson or um, you know, Ford Align or, or companies that, you know, have equipment or materials that are being um, stored outside in the yard that then can then, you know, be transferred to a construction site um, to be installed on the site, like piping or fire hydrants or, you know, even wood trusses for, for residential homes. So all that stuff can be stored outside and then you know, it, it's more advantageous to the, uh, to the tenant or the owner to have that next to their building and close by where they can go and grab it with either a forklift or a, you know, flatbed truck and then head out and, and, and go rather than keeping it in the warehouse. So that's just in a nutshell, you know, what we're seeing for outdoor storage. Uh, people typically, you know, when it first came out, thought it was all for truck parking. So they thought it was, Hey, you know, Amazon has, you know, all these deliveries that, need to be, you know, you know, deliver to people during COVID. Everyone thought that outdoor storage was, you know, truck parking. It is, but in the Charlotte market, we've seen more demand from tenants and our users for, the, you know, like I mentioned, the construction material storage or equipment storage uh, to help with the development of Charlotte. Yeah, I see it. So I, first off, I see it now more than ever. Whenever I drive around, it's kind of like when you buy a new car or get a new car or whatever, you start seeing it on the road everywhere. So now I'm sure as folks are listening, as they're uh, driving in their cars, they might notice it. Uh, but I see it now. There's one location near me, near my office, where it's off the highway. So right off the highway. And it's like just, I don't know, probably if I eyeballed it, maybe three acres. And it's just packed with construction trucks, or like the big bucket thing that like lifts up for, you know, uh, electrical poles or whatever. And yep, it's just totally contractor. Yep. Exactly. Like the signs that you see, like where it says, you know, right lane closed ahead or something like that. Like a ton of those just parked right there off the side of the road. So I'm sure maybe the state uses it. I'm not really sure, but they might have a couple of different users on that, on that particular yard, but that's what it is, right? It's so 
you touched on a couple of things, the supply of it, the demand of it, and then we want to talk about how investors make money on it. But let's talk about the supply and the owners of it right now. So it's a yard. You described it well. It, typically fenced, like what sort of like security or what kind of features are the tenants looking for uh, and the owners provide for these folks? If you want to identify, analyze, and invest in the best self storage deals out there, then you need quality data. Tracked IQ provides accurate, transparent, and vital information for over 57,000 self storage facilities and 4,000 storage development sites. What sets Tracked IQ apart is their comprehensive data on 70,000 residential and 200,000 commercial construction projects across the U.S., along with traffic counts, flood zone maps, and much more. See why the most sophisticated investors in the industry use Tracked IQ for their underwriting. Visit trackediq.com forward slash Chris, K R I S, to book a demo today and save 10% on your subscription. The link is in the description below. Tracked IQ, analyze more deals with more confidence. Yeah. So, so what we've seen the demand, like I mentioned before in Charlotte, um, the outdoor storage site, um, the industrial site will have some sort of building or structure on it, even if it's, you know, like a, mobile mini, uh, type, uh, you know, office trailer on site, you know, somewhere where someone could go use the restroom, plop down with their laptop with Wi-Fi, um, you know, be able to charge their handhelds or charge their cell phone and then go back out in the field. Um, but typically what we're seeing, it's, it's gated, it's lit, it's fenced. Um, typically it's graveled, it's paved. That's, that's, um, you know, a premium. Um, but in Charlotte, we don't, we don't see much difference between um, you know, graveled and paved sites, um, you know, as far as a pre charging a premium for rent. Um, but those are the very high level. You can get into uh, a few more nooks and crannies and a few more, um, you know, premiums on the site, but that that's essentially the basics of what you would need, um, you know, on a, an outdoor store site. Okay. So it's very simple. Uh, if I think of self-storage, for example, you're going to have a whole lot of other moving parts all the way from the rental system uh, the management company, you know, selling other ancillary forms of income and all that. So it seems like it's a lot more simple on the operations side. What are the leases typically like? Is it like, is it a one-year lease, a, you know, multi-year lease? Like, what does that look like usually? Yeah. So the, the sites that I just described with a building on, like you said, yes, it, it is very uh, property management, you know, less intensive in that sense. Um, there's not as much, you know, capex that goes into a site, and you do turn over a tenant. Um, you know, maybe add a little bit of gravel to the yard, but you're not you're not doing much in the warehouse. You're maybe upgrading the office a little bit. Um, but the leases that we've seen are anywhere between three and seven years, um, and you lock those in with you know annual escalations, which we're seeing about four percent annual escalations in the Charlotte market. Um, you know, so it's it's. It's becoming more institutionalized. Um, historically, you know, a lot of these owners were mom and pops and, you know, they lease it to their friend for a year and then you know, maybe a, a two year lease, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, as more institutional investors buy these assets, you know, they're becoming more, you know, three, five, seven year leases, um, you know, which become, which we've seen all, more on the uh, traditional industrial side as well. And they're all triple net leases as well. So, you know, the landlord buying it and, you know, the tenants paying for taxes and insurance, they're maintaining the yard. Um, you know, the landlord's responsible for the roof and foundation, that kind of stuff, but the tenants essentially, you know, paying for everything. Wow, that's interesting. So typically a roughly a three year plus lease. Um, okay, so that's the supply side of it. So oh well, let me back up for a quick second. It's not all the supply side of it. You mentioned zoning and we touched on that briefly. Um, I'm sure people listening are like, okay, what what size? yard are we talking about? Is it one acre? Is it 10? And then where do you look for these types of opportunities? Does it, like you said, what type of zoning do you need? Can you repeat that part? And then, um, you know, what size? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we're in Charlotte, um, Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and I'm sure a lot of uh, cities have seen this with, uh, especially in the Southeast with the population growth, but, um, we have an area in Charlotte called South and, um, that historically South of town, that historically was uh, was zoned for outdoor storage. A, a lot of industrial buildings were down there. Was zoned uh, heavy industrial. Um, you know, since the light rail was added, um, you know, a lot of multifamily, a lot of office, and a lot of retail developers have bought these 
um, you know, zone sites that were traditionally zoned for outdoor storage, there was a mass rezoning to um, a more advantageous zoning for a uh, retail, uh, multifamily and office development. So, um, you know, all that being said, you know, there's multifamily all going up in South End. There's cool breweries, all these old his historical industrial buildings, the wood trusts, you know, uh, uh, build it. Roofs are now brewery or restaurants or coffee shops. So all that being said, um, there's a net negative supply of industrial outdoor storage land in Mecklenburg County because all of those sites were either purchased by, like I mentioned before, the multifamily retailer office developers and, and, and the county and city never rezoned to the industrial outdoor storage or the heavy zoning. Uh, in Charlotte, because like I said before, it's, it's, it's kind of a dirty use. He doesn't really like it. Um, so, you know, talking about supply and demand, and I think this is happening all over like Nashville, Jacksonville, Atlanta, you know, these sites are being converted to a um, cool hip, um, you know, type zoning. Um, and these users, which I said before, are helping the city grow and build these types of buildings have nowhere to go. So with supply dwindling the demand still high because of all the construction projects with residential and um you know commercial development the demand is still really high so you know low supply high demand you know we can talk about you know getting into how these investors are making money um i think we all understand what happens then you know an investor buys a site the supply is very low you know they're charging pretty high rents for these tenants today and lease these industrial outdoor storage sites where, you know, there's very few, you know, few opportunities and they're essentially charging, you know, three times the amount that, you know, they were paying before. So, um, that that's kind of a, a very high level of what's happening in Charlotte and I'm sure other Southeast, um, you know, major cities, the supply is dwindling, the city doesn't like zoning to it. Uh, it's essentially impossible to get a zoning, a rezoning to. Um, this heavy industrial in Charlotte, uh, because the city doesn't like it. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I think it's happening all over the United States, honestly, which is why these institutional investors are chasing it. Yeah, that's interesting. So I remember South End, if anybody has been to Charlotte or whatever, it used to be, there was one apartment building built, I think it's called the Ashton or something like that. And, uh, you yep. could stand and the units on the back end and look out and it would just be nothing but like dirt. And like you said, the industrial type use. Now, if you go down there, that's the complete opposite of what it looks like now. There's almost no view because there's just commercial building, re uh, multifamily retail, all kinds of stuff. And it's cool. And I'm sure listeners are seeing that happen in their own towns where you can kind of wrap your head around the story, right? Oh, this place that used to be, you know, land or whatever, trucks parked on it or, or whatever was industrial use. Now, like you said, there's breweries there. There's other things and activities and retail. And it's become the cool side of town. Well, that is great for the residents and all that. But like you said, it makes it hard for the, if, if the town is growing, the city is growing, these construction companies need places to put their trucks and vehicles and all that. When you take away that land where they can park that stuff, they have to go further out or now there's just less of it. And so it drives up the, both the demand and subsequently the pricing on it. So the story makes a lot of sense. What's the typical size for a yard? Uh, is yeah. it an acre or two years? Like, what, so what we, like? um, we did an analysis for all the, um, these comps that we collected last year in 2023 and the typical lease sign in you know, Charlotte that we collected was a 13,000 square foot building with about three acres. Um, so any, you know, if I were an investor, you know, buying a site, I would buy a site, uh, that has a 10,000 square foot building with at least two acres of outdoor stores associated with it. Uh, we've seen the most demand from tenants, um, you know, in that size range, but you know, but there's, there's not really a, you know, a perfect size, you know, when you say, Hey, you know, what, wh what do you think is, you know, the best size for a site? You know, these, these sites have been chopped up a handful of times. And then there's you know, typically, you know, a stream running through half of it or, you know, trees on one side and you have to clear some stuff off. So, you know, all the good sites that, you know, that were in South and or on the North side of town, which were perfect squares. You know, they've been purchased by multifamily developers. So the ones that are left are, you know, you know, not, not the easiest to kind of maneuver and big trucks through. So, but on average, that was, you know, that was our, uh, 
that was our, our least comp average last year. And, and we've seen the same type trend this year. So can you take a site that doesn't have a building, a 10,000 or 5,000 square foot building and just put a, like a trailer on it, like a construction trailer? Cause I think the reason you have the building obviously is because people want to do work in their vehicles or whatever. They might need to store a few things indoors, but if you just don't have it, you have the parking space but you just don't have the building on it. You have maybe two, three acres or whatever. Can you do a trailer? Cause I, do they need to use a bathroom? Like what's the. Yeah. So that's, that's, we, we've seen success with people that have existing trailers, you know, on their site, you know, be able to, you know, lease it a little bit quicker than someone that doesn't have a structure on site. You won't cast as wide of a net to the tenant base. If you have that, um, you know, the, the, the smallest, uh, tenant base is, is, you know, a site with no building at all, with gated lit fence, and, and you kind of have a gate code to get in to park your trucks or leave your equipment. And then the next step up would be something with, like I said, a, you know, office trailer, like you just mentioned with a restroom or be able to, you know, work on your uh, laptop. And then the next step up would be, like I said, a five or 10,000 square foot building. That's, that casts the widest net um, because it allows uh, users to work in the warehouse, have a, you know, 16 foot drive in door, to bring equipment inside, work on it, you know, if it has troubles or, you know, to work, if it's raining outside to put, you know, put some stuff together, assemble some, or assemble some pieces together. So then put on a flatbed to go somewhere. Um, so that, that kind of casts the widest net. Okay. Got it. That yep. makes a ton of sense. Okay. So that's kind of the supply side of the equation on the demand side of the equation. We hit a little bit of that. So like you said, just now it casts the widest net. If you have a building on site and all that. What else are these guys uh, looking for, or is that pretty much it? Is it pretty that is it that straightforward? And so, yeah, it's, it's it, honestly it is that straightforward. Um, you know, it's it, it's being close as well to to rooftops or to the city uh, center city, especially if it's a, a tenant that's working uh, on a side uptown or south end, yeah, you know, where all the multifamily uh, and commercial development's happening. Um, but also being close to the the interstate. Um, you know, 77, 85, where we are here, or 485, uh, is pretty advantageous uh, to these tenants that are searching just because they can hop onto those highways and, uh, or interstates and be close to a you know, commercial development that we're seeing, you know, being developed along 85 or 77 here in Charlotte. So, um, that, that's, that's a, um, a big sticker as well, um, being close to, um, uh, you know, the Charlotte center city. Okay. And then. So it's important to have access to the highway, access to where they need to go closer to the downtown or construction areas, the better. Um, I'm curious to know, what does land like that cost? I know you can speak to here in Charlotte, you know, it's going to be different wherever you go in each market, but from the investment side and how do we make actual uh, money on this type of uh, venture, what does that land typically cost uh, if you're going to purchase it and try to lease it to an industrial user. Yeah. So, uh, I'll give you two examples. So, um, we helped sell a site off of North Graham street in Charlotte uh, last year. And, and then another one as well earlier last year. Um, and both of those have uh, 10 to 11,000 square foot building. on like I mentioned, 16 foot drive indoors uh, and the sites in total. One was, um, one was about three usable acres and the other one was about two and a half usable acres. Uh, both of those sold for, you know, just north of a million dollars an acre from an investment standpoint. Um, so one had a $3 million price tag on it and one had a, a, a around a three and a half million dollar price tag on it. Mm. And you mentioned usable acres. That's important. What is, what is that? I forgot to ask earlier. What does that mean? Yes. So um, it, it's funny because uh, I can relate it to, um, you know, traditional industrial buildings, right? Those are built. They have square footage is on them, just like, you know, self-storage, you have a square footage, you lease it, you know, I'm assuming at a you know price per square foot or, you know, a dollar per month. Right. So that that's easy to, to quantify. That's easy to get, you know, a civil engineer to, to price out or to, um, to lay out how large the building is. You chop it up and you say, Hey, this, this suite is X amount of square feet. When industrial outdoor storage was initially introduced, it's kind of a, you know, a swag that a broker or an owner says, you know, look at the GIS and say, hey, you know, the GIS says my site is five acres. And then from in my perspective, I'm going to measure, you know, 
you know, very, very high level, um, you know, on either Google Maps or the local GIS and say, well, if you take out the woods here, you got a detention pond, you got a sidewalk, a front parking lot, you know, the site's really only, you know, about three usable acres. And, and what uh, we're seeing is that you know, tenants can't use the woods, use the detention pond. They can't use the you know sidewalk other than walking maybe to a restaurant to go have lunch or coffee. Uh, and then the front parking lot is, you know, traditional, just, you know, uh, employee parking. So that's, you know, quote unquote, usable acres. And, um, you know, advertising has gotten um, and marketing has gotten a little better, um, you know, from a brokerage standpoint. Um, but there's still no true, uh, you know, measurement of usable acres unless you had, you know, a surveyor go out or, you know, someone actually you know, professionally, you know, measure the site. So. It's kind of still ambiguous on how many wakers there are, but you know, we try to do our best to, to measure what that is. And that usually, what we've seen is initially it was, you know, how many usable wakers the yard is, and then you add the building square piece to that. And now what we've seen is, um, you know, brokers and investors measuring the building and the usable acres of the yard to have a total usable acres, and then backing into the math of, you know, what we would charge on a price per usable acre for the entire site. Yeah, it's interesting. I've seen some reports or, um, yeah, just reports that like some states, uh, brokers and others will um, divide that up or, or come up with those metrics a little bit differently. So like here in the Southeast, we'll look at usable acres and with the building and all that. And there's other people who underwrite it a little bit differently. But the point is, is that they want to know what can they use obviously and that's what they're going to pay for they're not going to be paying for the detention pond like you said because they can't use that to park any vehicles they could but that would cause a problem <laughs> so that nobody, a big problem. <laughs> that nobody wants uh so that's something important to keep in mind but so back to what you were saying earlier about the uh, recent sales that you had so about a million bucks per usable acre uh is what we're seeing here in the charlotte market is that right okay yep. and it, it. it's creeped it's creeped up a little bit um, just because, like I said before, the supply is extremely low um, and the demand is very high from an institutional perspective, but also from an owner user perspective. Um, a lot of these owner users were either leasing or they own their site and, you know, they sold their site to an institutional investor because they paid them, you know, an exorbitant yeah. amount of money. And they said, well, I'll just go find something else. But then they quickly found out that, you know, there's really not that much supply out there for it. So, um, you know, we've seen that number creep up a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's, I would say it's right around a million dollars an acre, especially where interest rates are today. Okay. Yeah. So that, that makes me wonder about the, um, Zenith JP Morgan partnership to go out and do, I think it was like 750 million. Let's call it half it a million. Okay. Yep. 750 million. So if you're paying, you know, I mean, I'm obviously I've seen some 10, 10 acre sites like in Texas for sale that were just pretty much raw land, but it was something you could turn into industrial outdoor storage. So if you're an investor, that's kind of your spread, right? What can I purchase the land for? How much would it cost me to upfit it if it needs it? fencing, lighting, et cetera, gravel? And then what can I sell it for? And obviously you check with your local market, of course, don't go based upon our numbers here exactly. But right. um, so that's important to know going in. But with like Zenith, Zenith and other groups, is there enough industrial outdoor storage to spend seven hundred and fifty million dollars on? If it's three, you know, if it's a million dollars plus or minus per acre, like it's yeah, kind I of mean, wild to think about. It's it's going to be very tough. And and one group I work with, um, they raised nine hundred fifty million dollars, you know, last year to go buy this stuff nationwide. Um, you know, Charlotte's Charlotte's a very, you know, I guess. It's a smaller market and the, and the price per acre is a lot lower. So if you think about, I mean, it could be achievable. You buy sites in Miami, you buy sites in Los Angeles, you buy sites in the Northeast, you know, Boston, New York, New Jersey. I mean, I, I don't know the price of those, but I'm, I'm thinking that you could chop off some 50, $60 million um, sites pretty, pretty quickly. Right. Um, especially if you get some of those guys, but in Charlotte, you know, like I said before, the average size was a 13,000 square on three acres. Um, I, I probably should do, you know, an average purchase, you know, comp, you know, over 2023, I'll do that for 2024, but I'm guessing it's, you know, somewhere around, you know, three to $4 million, right? So if you do the math, if you're just in Charlotte trying to spend $350 million, you know, it's essentially impossible, right? 
know, nationwide, it could on uh, because of some of the major cities where you know, the stuff is trading for, you know, five times what Charlotte is, but, you know, go into, you know, larger sites, um, analysis and from our understanding, you know, back to the zoning also question you asked, you know, ML2 is our zoning in Mecklenburg County mm -hmm. that yeah. industrial door storage is allowed. Um, it was formerly I2. Um, there are sites that are zoned ML1 as well that are allowed to um, have outdoor storage in Mecklenburg County. Um, and then also there's the smaller uh, towns surrounding have their own zone as well. Um, but we did an analysis with ML1 and ML2. Uh, and when it was zoned I2 in Mecklenburg County, um, there were uh, 15 sites over eight acres uh, that were zoned I2 in Mecklenburg County that could potentially be purchased for outdoor storage, um, you know, with or without a building. So if you do that math, I mean, that's, that's really not that much, um, especially of scale. So I get a lot of calls from investors and it's, we need to, you know, we need to buy a, you know, 10 or 15 acre site with, with some buildings. And I was like, guys, there's 15 in all of Mecklenburg County and, you know, four of them are owned by Duke, I'm making numbers up, four of them are owned by Duke Energy, you know, three of them are already sold to other investors and then, you know, six of them are owned by institutional investors already. So, you know, you know, the supply is very low to buy this kind of stuff, especially on scale. Wow. So would a group like Zenith purchase a smaller yard, a three acre yard? Roughly you know, plus I spoke to, I've spoken to them before. I've never transacted with them. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but you know, I work a lot with, um, Altera property group. Uh, they raised $950 million and, you know, we're under contract for, you know, uh, seven, $5 million, um, you know, two pack in the industrial outdoor storage site, um, you know, the, they purchased the other three and three and a half million dollar sites. So, uh, those groups are buying smaller, uh, you know, smaller, smaller sites because, you know, they have to have to spend their money and, you know, they're obviously good deals. Uh, they're not, you know, stretching by any means, but you know, they have to spend their money and, and they're a good return on them. So, um, it's, you know, they, they, they've understood that they have to chop away at these smaller sites and, um, you know, hit it, hit a home run on either, a you know, a large portfolio uh, nationwide, like I say, a lease back portfolio, uh, or like I said, you know, hit, hit some home runs in Los Angeles, Miami, the Northeast, um, you know, other more major markets where the stuff is selling at a premium. Interesting. So. Would they ever purchase a site and do the um, kind of the upfits or what, whatever you want to call it? Like, let's say it's just vacant land, but it's vacant, zoned. Like raw land? You yeah, know, just raw it's, land, it's, but it's zoned properly, ML2, right. ML1, or whatever it might be in, in, your, in somebody else's city, but it's zoned properly. Uh, it's for sale. Would they ever purchase it and then, excuse me, do the so, improvements themselves? Yeah, so um, some investors that I work with would and some wouldn't. You know, it varies depending on whether they have developed experience or whether it's actually kind of worth their time to do it, right? So that that stuff takes a lot of time, a lot of manpower. Um, you know, a lot of these shops, um, you know, four or five guys, you know, or gals running around, you know, trying to buy these institutional um, size and industrial outdoor short sites. And, you know, if they're buying a site that, you know, maybe has a, a small building on it, but has four or five acres that needs to be developed, you know, that takes a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of power, um, and to get that stuff done. So it's, um, it's almost more advantageous for them to buy existing sites, uh, just cause it's, um, less time and, um, you know, less headache and less uh, hurdles to jump through. That makes sense. If you got a small shop, you're looking for a way to put out $750 million. It's not worth the time and effort to go through the approval permitting process and oversight of the construction, the development process of that, even though it is pretty simple, you could probably theoretically, I, I assume you get it done like within 60 days, put up a fence, put gravel and all that stuff, but it's still not worth their time uh, to do all that. If you're underwriting and looking at sites nationwide. And like you said earlier about New Jersey and other places, as I was asking the question, I realized, oh yeah, there's other places that have massive amounts of industrial outdoor storage or zoned industrial um, parcels that would make a ton of sense and cost a lot more than what's here in Charlotte. So that does make sense to raise that much capital and go out. Yeah, and look but for it's, it, but, but Dan, but to answer your question, I think it still will be really tough. Um, and 
on the institute on the uh, traditional industrial side as well, a lot of these uh, investment groups have raised you know hundreds of millions of dollars to go buy traditional industrial, and you know it's really tough out there to find deals that that make sense, especially with where interest rates are today. Good point. I'm wondering on the ownership side. So if someone were looking at a at a parcel, what sort of issues could come up? You don't have to name every single one, but during due diligence, I'm thinking environmental could be a problem, right? That you want to check for. Uh, but what's what are some other things that you've seen have come up that owners, investors should be aware of to try and mitigate on the front end? Yeah. So environmental is the biggest one. Like I said before, this outdoor storage use is is a pretty dirty use um, historically have been in you know, major industrial areas with underground storage tanks or, you know, equipment where you're working out in the yard and you're, you know, changing the oil or your hydraulic fluid, you know, kind of in the yard. And that that's, that's the biggest problem with these industrial outdoor storage sites. It can be overcome. Um, I've had a handful of sites that went to a phase two, had an understanding with, uh, you know, the seller and, you know, figured it out. But other things are, you know, with, the zoning, uh, checking to make sure with your local zoning uh, that the site, you know, 100% allows for the use that, you know, either if you're doing a sale lease back uh, and the change of ownership, you know, they're going to check, you know, the zoning on that to make sure it complies. Uh, then also uh, making sure that tenants that you potentially uh, maybe had in your pocket when you're buying the site or tenants that you think would want to lease the site, that it would be allowed. Um, you know, in that zoning. So those are the two biggest things um, that I've seen, you know, uh, you know, with industrial storage sites. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Okay. Very good, man. I think we covered a ton of ground. Let's get to the final four questions as we wrap everything up here. So Greg, talk to us real quick about a high point in your career and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah. So um, it was actually before I started in brokerage, uh, high point in my career, I was working, um, you know, in the, in the mortgage industry, uh, for about seven years, um, you know, stuck behind a desk and, uh, didn't have much opportunity to get out and go meet people, uh, like you and I did over at Starbucks or have even have the ability to do, um, you know, a podcast, but, um, my high, the high point in my career so far, uh, has been, uh, studying, uh, and passing, uh, the, my real estate exam on and having the ability to get into real estate brokerage and open my world up to, to real estate. Um, you know, I was introduced to it uh, by one of my good friends, um, him and his buddies, um, a lot of real estate up in uh, Boone, uh, North Carolina. Met with him. He's like, you you know, you have a pers- pretty decent personality. You know, I like you as a person. I think you do all right in this real estate thing. Uh, you should try and get, and then my dad also told me, you know, the same thing. Uh, you should try and go get your real estate license. So that that was honestly the biggest, the high point of my career is passing my real estate uh, test. North Carolina is not easy. I mean, I'm I consider myself a pretty smart person, and that was honestly the hardest test I've ever taken in my entire life. I mean, passing that class test and then passing the federal exam to get your your real estate license uh, that was a, that was a high point in my career because I knew that um, you know I was 31, um, you know, started kind of essentially started over in my career and uh, was, it was a high point and I haven't looked back, but it's been great. That's awesome. I just had another guest on, uh, Brent, and he mentioned the same thing that he, he said he thinks he has the record for the number of failed attempts. I think he has like <laughs> six, six or seven failed attempts at getting his real estate license uh, between North Carolina, I think it was Georgia or somewhere else he was trying as well. And I think he said he failed a number of times there. So over 10 times, I think he failed the, the real estate an exam altogether between a couple of different states. So uh, I think a lot of people feel the exact same way. I used to teach the licensing class, believe it or not, for the yeah. state of North Carolina. I did that briefly during the uh, kind of during the pandemic uh, situation. So yeah, it was it's tough. It's it's tough man. The combination of you know the class test. I don't know. It might have changed when I was taking it. You only had two chances to pass that test. So you failed twice. You got to take that class all over again. So that. There's no, I was like, there's no way I'm doing this. I mean, that was <laughs> a lot of time and a lot of energy. You know, it was, it was tough. So You're like, this sucks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, talk real quick about a low point in your career and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah. Um, it was, uh, when I was working in the mortgage industry, you know, going in and, um, 
you know, not really feeling like I had like a, a goal or purpose of what I was doing. Um, and that's when I really, you know, started digging deep with, um, you know, what I wanted to do, uh, with my life and, and kind of restarting over and, and really thinking about, Hey, you know, do I really want to, you know, continue on this path and, you know, not have an opportunity to go with people and, and really, you know, kind of shape Charlotte uh, and help out with, you know, what's going on, uh, in the real estate industry. So kind of, you know, had some moments where I was. I was kind of debating whether or what, what I wanted to do and, and how I wanted to, you know, move forward in my life. And, and that was kind of the low point, just not really understanding, you know, wh where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, finally just made the jump and started the real estate exam. So I'm sure everyone's been through that in their career where you're just kind of sitting there there in the morning and you're like, what am I doing? Like, what? this isn't, I'm not enjoying this. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not something that um, I feel good about. You know, it's just, you're just kind of going through the motions and doing your thing and, you know, not really uh, enjoying, you know, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. That gets pretty tough sometimes and you feel like you're in a rut. Uh, yep. So it's great that you were able to figure out, you know, how you wanted to transition and um, do something else. And obviously that's worked out really well for you. So sometimes those hard points push us to do things that we wouldn't have normally uh, done otherwise. And sometimes Absolutely. those rewards can, can pay off. That's great, man. All right, share with the folks a business or investing, industrial outdoor storage resource, you know, whatever comes off the top of your head there, but share with us a resource that where folks can go and learn more uh, about the industry, the business, or just improve their themselves. Yeah, and like I mentioned before, I mean, industrial outdoor storage is, is it's a pretty um, new asset class. So, um, and so there's not many resources out there, but one good one, give you a really high level and I mentioned Charlotte every once in a while is, is iOS list. Um, you can just search that online. Um, I think it's been mentioned before on your podcast, but it's a pretty good little resource. And then uh, next Thursday uh, in Atlanta, there's actually going to be a conference. Uh, people are getting together in, in person, um, you know, to meet and kind of have some networking and, and, you know, talk about the market and what's going on uh, that in Atlanta. So I'm going to that next Thursday. Um, and then honestly, I mean, it, it, your local business journal, um, I know it sounds kind of um, an odd to, to kind of point people in that direction, but there are articles that pop up every once in a while um, about outdoor storage and then LinkedIn. Um, there's some really good stuff on there. If you search, you know, either hashtags or however you search on LinkedIn and, and follow some people on there, there's some really good information and um, really good articles that, you know, you can be pointed to, um, you know, online that have information about it. So. Um, it's, I, I'm excited to see where it goes uh, before saying it's, kind of, you know, where, uh, self-storage was maybe you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's really in its infancy stage. Um, Justin Smith and I, um, uh, in our lawyer's office, we like to think we're in about the third inning of the baseball game right now with industrial outdoor storage. Just get, just getting started. You know, you know it's, it, it's just getting going and, um, like to see where it's going. So it's. It's fun and uh, it's exciting. So, yeah, that's great, man. I forgot about that conference. I didn't realize it was next week. Um, I thought about going, but um, we'll see. It might be a little bit too late, so we'll see. All right, man. How can Greg? How can people contact you if they want to do business, learn more, or just connect? Yeah, so uh, I'm on LinkedIn and shoot me a message to connect. Also, our Collier's website, Collier's Charlotte, has my with my listings and. Um, some articles we put out uh, recently on some sales uh, and my, uh, my email address is on there as well. I'm one of those people that if it's not in my inbox and I'm not going to do it. So uh, <laughs> you know, if you send me a note in my, in my email, I'll sh um, shoot you one back and we can connect. But the text on LinkedIn is, uh, send me a message there would, uh, would be good too. Awesome. Greg, thank you so much for being on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me.